maybe I'll get it right finally. Because understand, I can't get this. I still have my hand. Yeah. All right. Uh, the the text today is First John. I guess I typed there. It or well, I changed it. Verse sixteen through eighteen. Uh, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds. And that we wouldn't be distracted by our circumstances, the things around us, or even things in this text that might be an obstacle for us. But we would focus on the confidence that we have in Jesus, the hope that we have in your promise that we belong to you and no one can take us away from you. And that we would remember that we're all in this together, Lord, and you've commanded us to love and pray for one another. Lord, may your spirit remind us of that throughout this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, this is a, this one has, so there's certain things that, that passages in the Bible that stand out to us because it's like, wait a minute, what does that mean? And for some people, uh, we're just like, well, that's confusing. I'll, I'll focus on the good, su the good part where you know I'm encouraged and uh, love God, pray for people, love a people, pray for them. And I get stuck on some of these weird things. And one of the things I got stuck on this week was this. Well, not even just this week, I've, because I've struggled with this before, is the sin that leads to death. All right. So the verse, and it. it to me, it, it, it jumps right out at me, and I, I, I want to get this out of the way before I get to the heart of the message. And it's not to just get it out of the way. I, I, I just want to present some thoughts. So when you come across this again, if you know when you read your Bible, I'm sure you'll see it again, and you'll be like, what does that mean? So I, I want you to have some ways you can think about this. And there's been a lot of commentary on this over the years, and I'm so I'll present some of that. But it, it says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. And this is what gets me. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. So that's my question. What is the sin that leads to death? And... If you guys haven't noticed by now, I, I like to read and research a lot. So this one consumed a lot of time for me this week, trying to find as much thought as I could on this passage. So uh, the first thought is the Old Testament. So when, when they would offer sacrifices in the Old Testament, there were sacrifices for all the different types of sins and intercession for it. But they made a distinction between sins that you commit inadvertently, that is, you don't go out and intentionally do it, and rebellious sins, where you're intentionally rebelling against God. And in the Old Testament, it said in, that there's no sacrifice for that kind of sin. It's, it's like one of those things where if you, if you sin like this, you're out of the family. Like you were kicked out of the community. So, I don't think that that's quite what this has in mind, but it's there. Um, now, the in Catholicism, they make a distinction between mortal sins and venial sins. Okay, mortal sins, as it says, are sins that lead to death. Like, so, in other words, well, and venial sins are lesser sins. Now, the distinction is venial sins hurt our relationship with God. In other words, it takes us out of a right relationship with God, but it doesn't affect our salvation. 
Now, mortal sins are sins that not only take us out of relationship with God, but they separate us from God in such a way that if you die with an unconfessed mortal sin, you go straight to hell. Uh, so that is the reason in Catholicism, if you commit suicide, you immediately go to hell. There's Because you committed murder against yourself, which is a mortal sin, and you cannot be forgiven for it. Now, I don't know if that's the right idea either, but this is the actual verse that Catholics use to make the distinction between mortal and venial sins. I want to get it out there so, you know... You kind of know where this is coming from. Now, some people say there's a specific deadly sin. And this would be a very high-handed, rebellious sin. One example would be when Jesus spoke about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, every sin can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit you can't be forgiven of. Now, that's a whole other sermon, because that's one of those other passages that everybody's like, well, what is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Some people think that this sin that leads to death is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And in that would be... But it, it, it also can mean, for some people, uh, a sin that the earthly punishment for it is death. Okay, so Ananias and Sapphira would be a good example of this. They lied to the Holy Spirit and they were struck dead. If you, if you remember the story, uh, this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, all the people in the early church in Acts were selling stuff and giving the money to the church. And Ananias went to the apostles. He had sold some land and he gave them all the money. He gave them the money and made this claim that they gave him all the money. And they lied to the Holy Spirit and first Ananias dropped dead. Then... His wife comes and she's questioned and asked, did you give all the money? And she claims they gave all the money and you know, she's told, you didn't lie to people, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Behold, the people that are carrying out your husband's dead body are coming and they're going to carry out your dead body. And she drops dead. So some people think that is what the sin that leads to death is. That to me seems a little more logical than... The, the previous ones, but it might not be. Uh, the Why well, I said blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. See, I'm getting ahead of myself again this week. Now, another thought is that this is a total rejection of the gospel and of Jesus. Now, not just a rejection in the way that you're thinking, like, I don't believe that, it's nonsense. I think John might have in mind those false teachers that he referred to as the Antichrists earlier in the text. That it's these people that not only deny the gospel, they deny Jesus is God and everything in the Christianity is fake and they're just trying intentionally to turn people against Jesus and against God. It's the, the false teachers manifested the spirit of the Antichrist. They separated themselves from the two, true church. They perverted and rejected the message of redemption in Christ. And they deliberately rejected the incarnate Son of God in whom eternal life is available. They committed themselves to a spiritual attitude and a course of action that could only be characterized as sin unto death. Now, if, if that's, well, if any of these are correct, and I, I think that the further down the list you get, it, it's closer to more correct answers. I don't have an actual position on this because these are all positions that the church in one denomination or another has held historically. They, th this is what they think. And now you see why I wanted to get this out of the way. <laughs> like, so you're not distracted. But, or maybe I'm just distracting you right now. But... John is basically, I think, saying that for those who willfully, resolutely, irrevocably reject the teaching about Jesus, what he did, who he was, 
it's 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 useless to pray for those people because they've already rejected everything at such a to such an extent that they're not going to turn back now and I'm going to I'll talk more about this later but this is not saying people that have done bad things or done dumb things or even people who have persecuted the church because if you remember the apostle Paul started out trying to destroy the church and destroy the message but he had never been encountered by he had never encountered the presence of Jesus so when he encountered the presence of Jesus he repented these the I think that the people they're talking about here are intentionally unrepentant they've intentionally chosen to attack the Savior even as the Savior offers them salvation so but all that to get to this point right what the all sin is wrongdoing right but there's a sin that doesn't lead to death everybody does bad things non-christian before you people become Christians they do bad things Pray for those people. They can be forgiven. They can repent. We as Christians do bad things. And maybe the bad things we do stand out even more because we claim that we serve this, our righteous Savior. And when we do bad things, it's even it looks even worse. You've all heard it said, oh, and they say that they're a Christian. If you haven't heard that in your life, well, you heard it now. Like... I used to hear it all the time. And I hear it a lot in churches. When people were gossiping about each other. Well, they claim to be a Christian, and look at that. This message today, is it, it's driving us in a different direction than that. Okay. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. And this is our hope. This is the reason that we pray. Because we have this promise that those of us who trust Jesus, even if we sin, God is going to protect us and the enemy is not going to touch them. And so I want to read this and it's, it's just a wonderful quote. Um, it's by uh, Charles Spurgeon in an address that he gave to pastors. He said, might not we win more victories if we more constantly use the weapon of prayer? All hell is vanquished when the believer bows his knees in supplication. It's a little dated. Beloved brethren, let us pray. We cannot all argue, but we can all pray. We cannot all be leaders, but we can all be pleaders. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. I would sooner, sooner see you eloquent with God than with men. Prayer links us with the eternal, the omnipotent, the infinite, and hence it is our chief resort. Resolve to serve the Lord and to be faithful in his cause. For then you may boldly appeal for him for help in a time of need. Be sure that you are with God, and then you'll be sure that God is with you. Now, while in this passage it seems like John's thoughts are kind of going in a different direction, and it's talking about praying for other people, and through. One of the things I want to ask when, when I go to heaven and, and I meet John, I want to ask him, why, why did you put that verse in there about the sin that leads to death because and not praying for those people? Because that really d distracts me and it makes me think to myself, so am I praying for people I'm not supposed to be? But that's not the message. Okay? He's not changing direction here. He's, he's continuing with that same message of hope and confidence that we've seen so far. Now, if you remember, the best place to be as Christians is abiding with Jesus. That is, in the loving, dependent, trusting relationship with God that we are meant to be in. 
And it's clear that sometimes we fall short of that idea. But even when we fall short, we can have confidence that we can return to Jesus for forgiveness. In other words, sin actually does affect our relationship with God and with other people. And sometimes we notice it more, and sometimes we notice it less. Sometimes we can keep on going down a stupid path for a really long time before we realize how far we've strayed and how much our relationship with God has been hurt. But we also saw that when we pray, when we turn back to God, and when we pray again according to his will, we can be confident that God is going to answer those prayers. And last week I talked about the two, two main ways, not the only two ways, but two main ways that we can pray according to God's will. One of them is for repentance. People asking God for forgiveness. And that category would extend to us all praying for people we know that are not following Jesus. If you have friends, if you have relatives, if you have co-workers, if you have people you know, and if you have neighbors that are not following Jesus and you pray for them, you are praying according to God's will. But this week, John kind of draws us to this other category of fellow Christians who may have wandered from following God's will. And he's saying we need to pray that those people repent. Because we know that God wants everyone to be saved. And God wants all people that follow Jesus to be more and more conformed to his image. In other words, the sanctification part. That's his will. He wants us to be more like Jesus as we try to show the world Jesus. So, what do we do when we see people sinning? Right? If it's the world, if it's people outside the church, we pray for them. We share Jesus with them. Not necessarily standing on a street corner with a Bible in your hand screaming, repent for the kingdom is at hand and you have a little sandwich board with a Bible verse. That's not necessarily what it's saying. But it's share Jesus with your life. Share Jesus with your actions and your words. But I also think that this, this passage gives us a first clear step in what it looks like to, to really love people around you in the church. So before I go any further, I want to just say what this doesn't what John is saying it doesn't involve is going and telling someone else. If you see somebody sinning, quite often the first response is, hey, did you hear what Jerry did last week? Yeah, he got arrested. Oh, he says he's a Christian. That's not what we're supposed to do. I mean, people like to talk about what we see. That's why there's ch channels like TMZ where all it's about all the celebrities doing dumb things because that, you know, we like to look at it and laugh. Cuz hey, I didn't do anything that dumb, and even when I did, it wasn't on TV. But no, the the only here, the only person that you talk to is God. And you're asking God that the person would be led to turn from their sin and return to God. Okay. And and the second thing is that stood out to me that there are places in the Bible where it tells you to talk to somebody about their sin. This one doesn't say that. This one just says pray. Now there, there might be an appropriate time to talk to your brothers and sisters in Christ about something that they're doing that may not be appropriate but this doesn't even go that far. We are called to pray for them and pray that they might be restored. Now, this might actually also have a benefit for ourselves because I know when, when I, in my experience, 
when I've seen problems start in churches, someone was offended and they felt like they had to say something. They went to that person, offended them, then that person went back, and then they got more people involved, and suddenly they've started a little war. Yeah. The benefit for this is if we stop and we pray, we might just see that other person as God sees them. We might have compassion. We might learn to love and support that person through our prayers rather than starting a feud. In other words, instead of going out and talking to the person, maybe we need to keep our mouths closed and go and open our hearts before God. Now, I, I will talk about this very briefly, hopefully. The Bible does talk about appropriate times to address someone who has sinned. Okay, Galatians 6.1 Brothers, if anyone caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, I want to just point out three main things. First, it's an individual that goes to this person. So, if, if you see someone who has done something horribly sinful or offensive or anything else, you need to go to talk to that person. You don't need to drag a bunch of friends with them. Hey, we're going to have an intervention and, you know, let's go talk to Brother Jerry again because he's, he's sinning up a storm, right? You go, you go there and talk to the person about it. And the goal is to restore that person and it says to be gentle. Okay. Now, you're doing this, verse 2, because you're, you want to help, not because you want to point out somebody's flaws and, and show how you're better than they are or get a, a horrible offense off your chest because it's been bothering you for so long. Okay. It says, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. I think this is warning you to stop and examine yourself before you do it. Why are you doing this? Are you doing this because you were offended and you feel like you need to say something? Or are you doing it because you care about this person and you want to see them restored? Now the other one is from Jesus himself. And it's a little bit more involved. But it starts out in the same way. If somebody sins against you, you go talk to him or her. And you do it alone. You don't bring other people into it because if you... If he listens, you've gained a brother. But if he does not listen, this is one case where I think they put the masculine in there for a reason. Uh, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, I'm, my guess is here, it's not saying just grab random people and say, hey, Brother Jerry did this. Let's go talk to him. He wouldn't listen to me. I need some help. It sounds like these people saw what was going on as well. And you're asking to come with them. And then it gets worse. If he refuses to listen to them, tell to the church. If he refuses to listen to even the church, he's out of the family. Okay, that's... It sounds very harsh. But it's the same spirit is there. The goal is not that you get to kick Jerry out of the church. The goal is that they're going to be restored back into fellowship. Yes. So, and so in case the, the implications of this were, were not really that, that love is supposed to be the foundations weren't clear enough. I want to look at this from a different, like from the reverse as well. And because John doesn't ever even mention talking to that person, I would guess that at least my personal experience with when I've felt like I needed to talk to somebody about some offense that they had committed, I want to say at least 90% of the time, I probably just should have kept my mouth shut 
and prayed for that person instead of talking to them. And I should have thought about my motives, why I was going to do it. And I think that in most cases, my motive was I just wanted to be right. But this is, this is Paul in Romans 14. This is how not to correct a fellow believer. It says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself before God. This gets kind of to the heart of the Christian relationship. And I think it's kind of this like negative foil to what John is saying when he says, John says, love one another. What Paul is saying is don't be unloving to one another. And what that looks like is when you judge others, when you look down on others, when you think you're better than other people. He's telling us don't be unloving in the same way John tells us to be loving. And then we've all experienced this, living in a life, in a world that is built on relationships. Okay? Motives are often misunderstood. But it's clear that when you look at yourself, oftentimes maybe our own motives are the ones that are wrong in trying to figure out why people are doing things. I think if, if we put this, the two ideas together, like the, the positive and the negative, we, we should really quickly realize that as Christians, we're at least called to have a little bit of introspection before we pass judgment on somebody's actions or before we talk to people about their actions. The first question we should be asking ourselves is love the thing that's motivating what I'm thinking or what I want to do? Do I want to see this person restored or do I want to see them judged? So essentially well, all I'm saying is that when we see something that's happening, a person that we know is a Christian and they do something that looks bad to us or something we know is bad, before we even think about talking to the person, maybe even before we start analyzing why they're doing it or what they're doing, maybe we should take a moment and confront ourselves. Say, how do I love this person better? How do I feel about this person? Am I going to pray for this person with a heart of love? And if I can't do that, then how am I going to talk to this person with compassion? How am I going to talk to this person in a way that shows the love of God through Jesus to them if I can't even pray in a loving way for it? And this was, this was where I paused myself and I need to remember every time I think something like this that God is far more effective at correcting us than we're ever going to be at correcting either ourselves or other people. And I watch that when I, when I parent and sometimes my children will be doing something that yeah it might be annoying and it might be uh, bad behavior but my discipline of them is based on the fact that what they're doing is annoying me. It's not that it's that bad. I mean, it might not be good. And it's not that it's unselfish, because it might be selfish. But my reaction is not a reaction of, well, I want to correct my child and I want to make them realize that what they're doing is wrong and I want them to be better. It's just more of an attitude of can you just shut up and go to bed I'm tired and you just woke me up and now you're really irritating me because <laughs> you keep waking me up it's not that big of a deal okay. and I'm sure we all do this every day to somebody
<laughs> My wife looks really disturbed. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or confused. Maybe it was confused. Maybe I'm wrong motives. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we need to realize that our first reaction is not always the most loving reaction that we're meant to keep to to follow through on and what God's calling us to do. And I think that's why when I read this passage, I think that's why the I really think that I don't know if it's my mind or if it's the enemy that tries to distract me with this little phrase in there that says the sin that leads to death so that I miss the point of the passage that we're supposed to be loving in our relationships. Yes. We're supposed to be compassionate in our relationships. We're supposed to teach love and compassion to others. And part of that starts with us praying for others yes. and praying for others with the confidence knowing that when we pray according to God's will he's going to answer those prayers Amen. I don't have to worry about the state of another person and how they're going to respond to God's call in their life because what God has told me to do is to love that person and pray for them He's going to take care of the rest. That's not, it's not my job to change people's hearts at that level. I couldn't if I wanted to. If I wanted to convince you that the gospel was true, I can't do that. I can give you good arguments. I can give you good evidence. But I can't change your heart. Yes. Only God can do that. If a person is sinning, and I go and confront that person, it might make it worse. It might push them farther away. They might say, who are you to judge me? Go mind your own business. But if I'm praying for that person, God can change their hearts. God can take out a heart of stone, which he has done to all of us who believe in him, and replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart that responds to his word and responds to his love in a way that makes us want to go out and share that love with others. Yes. We're called to pray because God doesn't want anyone to perish. Yes. We're called to pray because He wants us all to repent and be in a good relationship with Him. He wants to bring us back to that place where we're abiding with Him, that we're in a loving relationship with Him. And just one of the things I want to point out in the closing is that John is concerned with our confidence, with knowing that the prayers that we make in accordance with God's will are going to be answered. In this context, John wants us to have confidence that our brothers and sisters in Christ who may have fallen into sin, may be struggling along the way, will be restored. And maybe we don't need to go any further than just praying for people. Maybe you're called to do more. But the goal of our prayer here is repentance. It's restoration. It's sanctification. It's a prayer that people would be brought back to that place of, a, of enjoying the abiding presence of God in faith and obedience according to his will. We can pray with confidence in this case because we're praying for people that belong to God. We're his children. He wants us in a relationship with him. That's why he called us. That's why we're here. So we can remain in that relationship. And we live in this promise. Okay, This is Jesus' promise. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. We belong to God. That's the promise we have. Nothing separates us from God's love. 
Okay? Our sin is going to affect our relationship with him in a way that we may have problems. We may be struggling. And it might be because of our sin. But it's not going to change the fact that we belong to him. And no one can ever take us away from him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just live in the hope that you give us in your word that we belong to you and nothing can separate us from you. That you love us and that you want us to love others. Lord, I, I, my hope is that we would learn to pray better for others that we would learn to pray with more love and compassion for others. For those here around us in the church, those around us at home and at school and in the world, at jobs, the people we meet at a gas station, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see them with the compassion that you see them. That we would, we would pray that no one would perish, that we would pray that everyone would come to repentance, that we would pray that on the last day we would all stand in your presence and you would say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter my rest. Jesus, give us your heart for our brothers and sisters who are called by the same name and give us a heart of compassion for those that don't know you. And may your spirit fill us with the confidence and the hope to pray for those people and to share with them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Because he lives.